On the 23rd of May, 2020, we launched our book, Achieving Biodiversity Protection in Megadiverse Countries, which assesses implementation of international and national biodiversity protection principles in our two countries. The book was the result of a collaboration between a large group of authors in both countries who did detailed investigations. We're really proud of the work that we've done, in particular because it provides some pretty clear evidence about where biodiversity protection works and where it is not working, and it gives some specific guidelines into where improvement might be possible. I will just run through the structure. So um, Gabrielle will take us through some of the, uh, the earlier part, the overview. Uh, then we're going to have uh, Amy, we'll look at biodiversity governance effectiveness. And then Larissa, we'll look at some ideas about innovation. Andrew, we'll look at uh, what we call uh, meta governance, so governing the governance system. And then we will make a few closing comments. Then I will try to unmute everyone. So anyone who wants to say anything or raise any questions or whatever should be able to do that. Along the way, if you, want, if you have a question you want to ask, you can type it into the Q&A. So I will hand over control uh, at this point to Gabriel. And hopefully, Gabriel, you now have control. You'll have to unmute that. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, now it's working. Uh, OK, so I will give a brief overview of the book and how, how all the research worked until we got the, the final publication of the book. So the first thing uh, you need to know is this is the result of a lot of work by many researchers. And this is also the less result, result from a partnership that had been going for almost a decade between University of New England, McKinsey University, and uh, UNICEOBI or University of CEOBI. Uh, this partnership started with Pomar, Professor Pomartin on UNE, Professor Marcelo Zinger on UNICEOBI, and mm -hmm. Professor Solange Telles at McKinsey. And they've been working on many researchers over the years. And on 2017, we had the, they, they had the idea to do a workshop in Australia, the governing for mega diversity, Brazil and Australia, and where we we had a, a large group of researchers from both countries. As you can see, in some photos here on the top photo we have. You can see us having some discussions and all the group of researchers here. We invited researchers from other universities, for example, Queensland University of Technology, uh, University of Brasilia, and so on. And on this workshop, we tried to come up with common issues regarding biodiversity that we could do research on. Uh, and always focusing on having one researcher, at least one researcher from Brazil and at least one researcher from Australia, so that we could compare common issues and, and see uh, common uh, instruments to solve these issues. Uh, later, uh, first uh, result of this workshop was the presentations at the IUCN Lokolokian on Glasgow in 2018. Many of the researchers submitted their work. It was work in progress, but we submitted. And many of us had the work approved for presentation. And the, the, the work was really well received. And this was the first indication for us that we had a great material to to do this book. Uh, so what was the, the three main motivations for... Okay. What was the, the three main motivations for the book, the, this book? Uh, it, it was 
the, the main motivation was three observations. The first one is that there are right now significant human concern about biodiversity loss almost all over the world, especially in mega diverse countries that are losing a lot of its biodiversity. Everyone, at, at least all the environmentalists and people who research the, the environment are, oops, uh, are worried about this. We had a, a recent data from, from a UCN that 28,000 species are facing extinction right now or are endangered. So this has been a concern for all the world. And the, the way that most countries have been dealing with it, it's creating a lot of instruments and we have been seeing and uh, uh, it's not going back. Okay, we've been seeing uh, an explosion of instruments and not only laws or public policy, but also uh, economic instruments, market instruments uh, coming up all over the world. But the main problem, and that was the main reason for this book, it's, is that most of these instruments are not being uh, effective. They are, they have insufficient effectiveness. And this, creates a, a, a vicious circle where we, the, someone, the government, create a, an instrument to protect biodiversity. The instrument is not effective and instead of trying to make this instrument work or, or trying to detect why it's not working, the solution is to create an, a whole new instrument. Forget about the last one, create a new one. And this has been going on and on in most countries in the world. Uh, certainly in both Brazil and Australia. So our aim was in this book was how can we make laws and instruments to protect bio biodiversity more effective? How can we shift the focus from creating more and more instruments to making the instruments that already exist effective? Because we had the perception that most of these instruments are good, they could work, but why are they not working? So we decided to use a method that had been developed uh, at UCN uh, in a previous research that Paul took part and Solange, that is an evidence-based approach. So once biodiverse governance and protecting biodiversity is such a complex issues because we, we, we are dealing with economic systems, social systems, uh, environmental system, the ecological systems, everything is involved. So they are really complex and there's a, a tendency, especially in law research, to use subjective uh, inside subjective conclusions to in the, in the research. And we didn't want to do this. We wanted a density based approach based on the best data available in both Australia and Brazil. So what we needed, first we needed uh, an objective diagnosis, the diagnosis of the problem and what was happening for, for us to, to use this approach. And what we did was we triangulated data from Australia and Brazil so we could see what was the common issues, the common problems, the common phenomena, and then based on this data, we could come up with objective conclusions. Uh, so I think that, that the greatest achievement of this book is using an evidence-based approach and having these solid uh, conclusions based on the evidence we gathered in both countries. So now I'll pass to Amy, who will talk to you about the first part of the book. Thanks, Gabriel. Excellent. So the slides are working for me as well. Thanks, everyone. Um, the chapters that I will present on focus on four really important industries that affect biodiversity conservation in both Brazil and Australia. 
you can see from the slide here, um, we'll be looking at agriculture, mining, marine protection, and indigenous people and protected areas. So firstly, agriculture in both countries um, is a really important industry. In Australia, it represents approximately 2.5% of our GDP, and in Brazil, it's about 5%. Obviously that fluctuates um, with market and seasonal um, conditions. Farming um, uses a lot of land in both countries as well, as you can see from the graph on the screen. About 34% of Brazil's landscape is used for agriculture. And in Australia, it's about 48. Also the main difference though here is that Brazil, the amount of land is increasing, whereas in Australia, um, it is decreasing. So, um, the, this chapter focuses on the relationship between biodiversity, conservation and agriculture and the range of issues that occur in both countries, some of them unique to one or the other, but most of them common, that occur as a result of some of the modern practices um, that, you know, we're using to achieve such high production. Invasive species, contamination, and the expansion of operations leading to habitat loss are some of the key factors that are examined in this um, chapter that lead to some biodiversity loss. Like Gabrielle's also already mentioned, there is an abundance of legal instruments um, aimed at biodiversity protection, but the implementation is often quite weak. So that's due to a lack of resources, um, both financial and human, and that limits their effectiveness. The availability of agricultural technologies and innovations is rapidly increasing, um, as we hear if you're in the industry all the time. However, there has been very few, or if any, that have led to um, benefits to the environment. One of the ongoing threats that we face um, in climate change is likely to exacerbate the issues that we already face in agriculture. And it's clear that we need to do more things um, to improve implementation. So there needs to be stronger economic incentive so that the people involved in agriculture, whether it be the farmers or um, employees, um, anyone managing land, sees that environmental protection um, is really important and takes it seriously. So for that, it needs to be both sufficient public and private resources um, is needed. So mining in both countries um, is also quite an extensive industry. Um, in Australia, mining is about 8% of the GDP and in Brazil, 3%. In 2010, um, Australia and Brazil were both respectively ranked second and sixth in the value of their minerals mined. So as many of you I'm sure know, mining involves lots of different people conducting lots of different processes, which can have a negative impact on the environment. Um, extraction, exploration, all those sorts of things involve violent disturbance of the environment. And not only is there a risk to biodiversity, but also vulnerable communities. And that's particularly occurs when large mines um, uh, um, are in areas where largely undisturbed um, and it can be quite difficult for those mines and the communities to coexist because often those processes are quite hazardous. Um, this chapter discusses the limitations of governance processes in both Brazil and Australia, which has led to contentious mine approvals in Australia and um, some mine disasters in um, Brazil due to some oversight. Went too far. So you can see on the screen here, the um, chapter focuses on some several case studies. So in Australia, we're looking at the contentious mine approval processes for the Bulga coal mine in New South Wales, and also Adani's Carmichael coal development in Queensland. So um, in Brazil, in the Brazil part of the chapter, we're looking at two of the um, most, uh, the largest mine disasters, the Mariana mine disaster and the Bradahimo Hino mine disaster. So these, these examples provide 
really great insight into the consequences of poor mine oversight, but also the contentious approval processes. While there's similar dynamics in mining governance can be observed in both Australia and Brazil, formally it appears that the instruments reflect the environmental and social protection principles from international agreements. The examples that are covered demonstrate that the implementation often falls short of desirable practice, which occurs in many areas um, of environmental law. This chapter demonstrates that laws and procedures which should ensure governance with integrity and transparency are necessary, but are not sufficient at the moment to deliver the desired um, biodiversity outcomes, but also the outcomes for the vulnerable communities um, that they're often involved with. So Brazil and Australia both have complex and often fragile ecosystems fringing the coastlines. In Australia, obviously, our, one of our greatest assets is the Great Barrier Reef. And these are impacted by the behaviour of many different people. So two um, instruments, the Marine Spatial Planning and Marine Protected Areas, they're really important and are used by both governments in Australia and Brazil to protect biodiversity and also regulate the activities that are occurring within these marine um, ecosystems. So on the slide here, you can see uh, there are many issues that um, affect marine biodiversity. And this is just a few of them that are mentioned in the chapter. And these occur both in Australia and Brazil. There's um, some different approaches taken by Australia and Brazil to the way that they govern marine biodiversity. And these are discussed, followed by a comparison of the challenges of creating effective marine protected areas. Marine biodiversity protection is focused on government actions and there is little attention paid to reshaping the underlying incentives and resources for effective marine protection. The authors in this chapter conclude that by highlighting the role of marine spatial planning instruments and its potential to foster ocean governance. So again, another area where the lack of resources, both human and um, financial are contributing to uh, poor biodiversity outcomes. So the last chapter that I will um, discuss is about the indigenous and traditional people and how they play an important role in both Australia and Brazil in the biodiversity preservation. So that's uh, obviously recognised by the Convention on Biological Diversity. Australia and Brazil are both occupied by really diverse populations of Indigenous and traditional people. The chapter here discusses the biodiversity governance arrangements in each country with regard to those Indigenous and traditional people in light of each country's constitutional and legal frameworks. The authors then identify the strengths and weaknesses of these national approaches and explore better national biodiversity governance approaches that could support indigenous land ownership and self-determination. So following the examination of Australia and Brazil's experience with biodiversity governance by indigenous and traditional people, the authors suggest the opportunity and need for improved implementation of the relevant CBD articles. So in doing so, they present a list of eight principles which they ask the parties to utilise in their governance of Indigenous and traditional peoples in protected areas. But they note that social, economic and ecological contexts for collaborative biodiversity governance initiatives in Australia and Brazil, they're, very, they're quite different between each country because of the, the location that, that we're in and therefore the effective legal base for these initiatives, they have to respond to local concerns and priorities so that you can't just do what we do in Australia, in Brazil and expect it to work. So there's no, um, no single model of law that can be recommended to manage Indigenous and traditional people um, and biodiversity in protected areas. So I'll now pass to Larissa.
So, Larissa, you now should have control of the keyboard. Do I have control? I hope you do. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about chapters six, seven, eight, and nine from the book. And uh, pass here. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. So, chapter six. Uh, this chapter uh, outlines the role that surfing reserves play in biodiversity conservation in Australia and Brazil. Uh, these surfing reserves demonstrate the possibility of uh, untapped opportunities to use recreation to secure biodiversity conservation in situations where purely environmental concerns are insufficient to obtain and fund protection. So both countries, Brazil and Australia, are, as we know, mega, mega diverse. And these surfing reserves are an important, innovative opportunity to meet biodiversity targets while helping protect social and cultural values and to deliver economic benefits as well. So uh, they, the, the countries, Brazil and Australia, they, they, the, the article, the chapter shows, reveals that uh, they have uh, contrast, contrasting examples of how surfing reserves have been implemented so far in these countries. And uh, in Australia, we have uh, uh, an advanced scenario of 21 uh, surfing, reserve, su surfing reserves so far. And in Brazil, we have only one so far, Guarda do Imbaú. And uh, we, we, we see the difference, but the, the most important of this chapter is really to, to show, uh, to demonstrate the possibility of this uh, innovative uh, uh, way, this innovative type of, uh, of protected area. So uh, the, at the end, this chapter uh, outlines uh, a new international union. Uh, can you pass, please? I'm not, oh, thanks. Uh, so uh, the, this, uh, this, uh, this case is identifying, as I said, a new international union for conservation of nature category. Uh, the name of the category would be a low impact passive recreation or surfing reserve that has a huge potential to deliver positive biodiversity outcomes. Uh, next, please. Okay. Uh, chapter seven is uh, a chapter that also brings a new innovative uh, arrangement uh, in biodiversity conservation that, uh, as we know, agriculture is a major cause of biodiversity loss. So we know we have international instruments, uh, CBD and other instruments that impose obligations to Brazil, to Australian government, and these instruments can only be satisfied if they engage agriculture and biodiversity conservation together. So this chapter discusses innovative industry stewardship approaches to biodiversity conservation that use a partner or hybrid arrangements between industry and government. So uh, to demonstrate the development, the development of this innovative approach, five Five aspects of hybrid governance are analyzed in this chapter. Uh, international farm industry initiatives uh, to domestic farm in industry initiatives, alignment of international and domestic responses, uh, fourth, international alignment of public and private response, and fifth, alignment of public and private responses at the domestic level. So these issues are examined within the context of four major agricultural industries in Brazil and in Australia. So cotton, sugarcane, beef, and dairy. So this is what chapter seven is about. Next. Um, chapter eight is, uh, brings another innovative solution in terms of biodiversity conservation and is about satellites, is regarding satellites. 
So uh, satellite technology, as we know, provides a, a, a means for helping provide data information that are necessary for monitoring natural resource use. So this chapter discusses the use, the application of satellite technology by Brazilian and Australian governments and NGOs. So uh, the Australian examples uh, derive uh, predominant, predominantly uh, from the use of satellite to control water use, the use of water. Uh, Brazilian examples uh, in, in, on the other side reveals that we've, we've been using this technology uh, mostly to track habitat destructions. Uh, so uh, we know this uh, is a challenge uh, to use this kind of technology, but it is a clearly useful technology. And the challenge is for both countries is really to provide and enable satellite data to be used in the best, in the best effect we can. Next, please. So uh, chapter nine is about drones. I'm one of the authors of this chapter and uh, it, it is regarding drones. And uh, as we know, drones are uh, mechanical devices that uh, are to varying degrees mobile. They can operate remotely from a human operator in aerial terrestrial or water context. So they have multiple uses. They are adaptable for many, many times of landscapes. So they have a, a really a, a large uh, kinds of applications uh, to help protect the environment and also facilitate or cause biodiversity harm and in another way. So they, they're made, the, the, the chapter uh, delivers that they are made of, in a mix of technologies they are able for sensing, for surveying, for communication and many technologies can be added to this kind of equipment. But uh, this chapter uh, considers some benefits, costs and risks of drones. Uh, technology uh, examines how this might be better managed because there are not only a positive side in the use of this equipment. So the risks are huge in terms of privacy, in terms of harms to biodiversity, not, not only protection, conservation of biodiversity, because they can use for both uh, uh, applications, unfortunately. So this chapter consider uh, all, of, all of these uh, uh, scenarios, all of these elements, and uh, the, the challenges that arise with this technology uh, in, in multiple, in its, their multiple uses. For Professor Andrew, now. Thanks very much. I'll just check I've got control. You here. should have control. Not working? Uh, just hold on. I think that's working. Hello, everyone, and uh, uh, good evening to our uh, Brazilian friends and good morning to our um, Australian friends. I just want that to go back to that slide. Uh, I'm covering the last few chapters of the book, and they're up on the slide. They involve funding, uh, they involve uh, the governance of governance, uh, the governance, how, how governance systems are governed themselves, as well as some uh, uh, strategies to improve outcomes. And I'd like to acknowledge the authors of those chapters and I've listed them on the, uh, on the slide. Um, I've uh, taken some quotes from the book in this presentation. I'd like to thank Marcia for uh, helping uh, with the translation into Portuguese uh, for those. Uh, Gabrielle and Amy have both already mentioned that uh, we probably don't need more uh, laws. We uh, probably don't need more international conventions and uh, regulations, domestic laws and regulations and uh, environmental institutions. And as this slide on the screen shows, um, we seem to have mountains of them. We've got thousands uh, of laws. And the chapters, the last few chapters describe many of the 
complex governance arrangements, and some of them are very sophisticated, and some of them are unwieldy, uh, and they all involve um, agencies and uh, regulations and programs and uh, planning and strategies uh, and uh, um, various institutions, and yet we're still in crisis. That's not to say we don't need um, better resourcing uh, for imp implementation of laws or better um, harmonization of laws and uh, regulations. And it's not to say the solution is, is deregulation of uh, environmental protection and, and that often just gets uh, oversimplified into arguments uh, for uh, so-called reducing green tape. Um, funding was a central focus uh, in the, uh, the CBD, and you can see that in, on the slide, Article 20 uh, notes the uh, requirement for countries to provide financial support and incentives. And a recurring theme in the final chapters is that in both countries, uh, there is just not enough provision of funds to deal with the current scale of the problem. Uh, and at the same time, governments in both countries are undermining conservation efforts, which will make it uh, more expensive in the long run. There also remains the problem of the scale of markets that profit from environment, environmental degradation and exploitation compared with uh, the markets that uh, profit from environmental conservation. The book also outlines some major differences between Brazil and Australia. They have different political and legal traditions, uh, different populations, different wealth profiles, uh, different ratings on a range of international indices. But both countries share a, a particular challenge when it comes to uh, uh, biodiversity conservation. Um, especially across uh, the large scale, large scale landscape wide conservation. Both countries have huge areas with very sparse populations. In both countries, most people live in the cities. They, they live in cities that are on the coast. That's where the people are. That's where the money is. That's where the GDP uh, is highest. And also importantly, the GDP per hectare is highest. But um, uh, that's not where the best remaining hotspots of biodiversity are. These lie in uh, more remote areas, uh, less developed areas, in rural backwaters and on farms, where the population is very sparse. Uh, and uh, the GDP per hectare, as you'll see on the slide here, is amazingly low, even for relatively wealthy countries uh, and advanced economies like Australia and Brazil. Of course, uh, remote places, rural places are also the places uh, that are often home to uh, indigenous peoples, Aboriginal peoples in both countries. Uh, and in both countries, these are amongst the most uh, disadvantaged citizens. So in other words, where biodiversity conservation is most needed, there's not the money, there's not the people to do the job, and there's probably not the ability to, um, to monitor, there's not the surveillance capability uh, to monitor uh, compliance with regulation over such vast differences. So what sort of funding gap do we have? What sort of uh, amounts of funding are likely to be needed? And these were actually impossible questions for the research team to answer because there's because of a lack of, da of data. But um, very helpfully, they pulled together from some of the literature, uh, some ballpark figures, and, and that gives us a sense of the magnitude of the, of the task. And I've, I've just put some of them on the slide, uh, which shows some of the, the numbers collected uh, by the research team. Other than that, the numbers are very speculative because in both countries, um, the governments don't really report very well on uh, government spending. It's not consistently reported. Um, and it's not reported in a way that helps us analyze the sources of the funds 
and the uses of the funds and the funding gap, and also important contributions from uh, the private sector and the philanthropic sector and the NGO sectors are not quantified or reported. And even if we could get better estimates uh, on the funding gap, there's another problem highlighted in the chapters, and that is that the government funding is actually diminishing in real terms. And there could be a variety of factors for this. Uh, the Brazilian authors mention a change of political philosophy uh, regarding environmental protection in Brazil. And in Australia, uh, some of the pressures identified are uh, pressures on government, are terms of trade, slow economic growth, an aging population, increased demand for health care, infrastructure projects and servicing deficits. And of course, that's only going to get worse uh, with the costs of the COVID crisis on top of that. So it's potentially a very difficult outlook. There's not enough funding in the first place and it's declining. And not only declining, but often funding is stop start. It's intermittent and, and discontinuous, which is problematic for uh, environmental issues that need a steady and consistent uh, approach. Sometimes the lack of commitment to environmental objectives actually imperils what little funding the governments can accumulate. And our Brazilian friends gave the example of the Amazon fund uh, where increased deforestation in the Amazon actually led to a couple of the major donors, uh, Germany and Norway, uh, uh, reducing, uh, substantially reducing their donations to that fund. The type of spending governments favour is also illuminating. So governments seem to be spending big on protected areas in response to the CBD targets. But, uh, and here's a quote, there is a lack of evidence that these investments are being matched with appropriate management funding. The overall assessment is that in neither Brazil nor Australia uh, are we abiding by our CBD obligations to commit sufficient economic incentives for biodiversity protection. The general thrust of recommendations in the book is better engagement uh, with private and civil sectors because uh, industry uh, creates and implements governance rules, consumer preferences uh, lead to eco brands or market standards that impose requirements on citizens, NGOs exercise political power, industry and citizen sectors have more resources than government does. Um, and some of that's applied to uh, purchasing decisions and investment decisions uh, that can uh, further environmental outcomes. Chapter 11 explored this notion of meta-governance, which uh, as you see on this, this slide, uh, concerns how uh, governance systems are managed, controlled or directed. And in the chapters, uh, if you want to read the chapters, there's five uh, essential ingredients of good governance systems that are listed, and I'll go through them very quickly. And the role of, of meta-governance is, is, as is on the slide, is oversight and improvement of these elements of good governance. And the first one is having a sound strategy, and that's certainly required by the CBD, but the, the qualitative assessment of the authors is that there's actually no process to review whether countries have uh, developed sound strategies. The second is adequate resources, again required by the CBD, but again, no system of assessing uh, whether uh, countries are abiding by that obligation. The third is clear accountability for implementation and outcomes. Again, there's no independent review of, of that in the, uh, in the current arrangements. The fourth is risk management. Again, no requirement for risk management by the parties in managing uh, the risks of their strategies. And the last one is arrangements to ensure accountability, transparency, and efficient resourcing. And again, the authors uh, conclude that this is not really happening. Um, the book also uh, critiques the reporting requirements of the CBD and every country is required to report from time to time 
on its progress and we're currently up to the sixth round of reporting. Um, in Australia's case, the authors conclude all these reports indicate that Australian governments have cherry-picked their international commitments, ignoring many and adopting others to a limited degree. And governments also use these reports as a kind of a PR opportunity, and they don't like being very frank and candid about the difficulties they face in implementing their strategies, and that's a, an obstacle to uh, honest reflection and uh, continuous improvement. There's a certain amount of self-promotion in the reports by the national governments, uh, which tend to neglect anything else other than action by the national governments. So not enough attention is, attention is given to the, uh, the contributions of uh, state and regional governments or of the non-government sector. The final strategy, uh, the final chapter, sorry, is about strategies and it has a a fairly um, mild sounding title, Strategies for Improved Outcomes, and that disguises a very important message. Firstly, it speaks of strategies, and uh, it has to speak of strategies because largely we don't have any, or we don't have effective ones, especially when it comes to financing and incentives, as the slide suggests here. Strategies also connote something uh, systematic and rigorous, but here are some of the typical conclusions of many of the many very worthy programs that are featured in the chapters. And I'll give you a, an example, a quote from an, a, a clue, uh, an evaluation of an Australian program, quote, the many plans and programs are fragmented and under-resourced. Problems include insufficient resourcing and inadequate monitoring and data and tardy responses. Frontline citizens are impeded by administrative complexity, shifting priorities and unreliable support, weak accountability and limited participation. And, and here's a quote from a Brazilian program uh, by the authors. Performance monitoring is often inadequate. Regulations are heterogeneous. The effectiveness of public policies is not satisfactorily assessed and licensing proceedings are burdensome and time consuming. Outcomes in uh, strategies for improved outcomes uh, gives the sense of end results, uh, end results for biodiversity rather than mere processes and procedures and inputs and outputs. And strategies for improved outcomes require some improvements in those outcomes. But the fact is, as we see in this slide, we seem to be going backwards. Strategies also involve some overall coordination and harmonization, uh, but in some cases, government policies are positively in conflict. To realize improvement, we probably need a more disciplined and systematic approach to evaluating whether governance is continually improving and meeting its objectives. And that's not to deny that uh, strategizing for improved biodiversity outcomes is challenging. It's very challenging. And the, the characteristics of biodiversity uh, add to the difficulties. Uh, and uh, Here's a quote, many biodiversity losses are caused by the accumulation of small harms, a death of a thousand cuts for the environment. Finally, I'd just uh, like to say that I think the book showcases the value of uh, empirical environmental governance scholarship. Governance have, governments have very usefully funded periodic scientific reports that make as best attempt as they can as a, 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 of a comprehensive overview. And that includes Australia's national state of the environment port, the last, the last one in uh, 2016. However, as noted by the authors uh, in the final chapters, uh, that report um, doesn't document nor critique the programs of the three levels of government, and it doesn't uh, uh, speak to civil society and industry, and it doesn't evaluate governance, including whether there's continuous improvement. And this reflects the dilemma of empirical government, environmental governance scholarship. It's hard to do, it's quite difficult. But the danger of a research approach that's constantly favoring uh, natural sciences over a type of governance science is that we end up with a better and better diagnosis of environmental disaster without much sense of a, 
uh, direction or ideas on how to solve it, which is essentially a social policy and, uh, and governance problem. So that's it, it from me. Thanks very much. Obrigado. Okay. Uh, I think I now have control again. I hope so. Can everybody hear me? All right. So what we want to finish up with is a bit of an indication as to where this is going to. And then Marcia Solange and I will give a little, a few statements just to finish things off. One of the things that you would have noticed is that Marcia Solange and I haven't done the presentations. And when you look at the makeup of the teams, we've really worked hard to work with our, I call them emerging scholars, can't call them all younger scholars. Of course, Andrew looks almost as old as I am. So, but basically to the next generation of scholars. And that's a thing that's been fantastic for all of us. It's, it's a really good thing, it's enjoyable, and we've got a lot out of it. So the expectation is that the next generation of scholars will be taking a lot of this work forward. So where do we go to from here? Well, this work started out of the IUCN Natural Resources Governance Framework. And the IUCN wanted to have a better framework for understanding natural resource governance. I don't know if that project is still going forward. Um, IUCN is going through its next iteration of re-strategizing and so on. But uh, through that, we got the opportunity to develop the first things around here while I'm at it, to, be, to, do, the, uh, to do the first part of this work, which was to develop a framework for assessing an empirical framework for, for evaluating implementation of biodiversity principles and the effectiveness of it. And there we had five different countries working on that. We developed a method and we applied the method on a trial basis, including in Brazil. So we had Australia, Brazil, China, South Africa and New Zealand. Then we started this particular project to take what would be called a deep dive into one country, or two countries, sorry, to really understand what is happening at the front line that is making biodiversity protection work or not. And we should be clear, the Biodiversity Convention has done and still continues to do an enormous amount of good work. We have no doubt that things would be far, far worse without the convention and its implementation. But also around the world, it is clear that it's not doing enough because the, the trajectories on biodiversity are disheartening for most of us. So then there were, out of that, there were a series of papers that were prepared, which are identified in this particular publication out of uh, UNICEF. And that's, that's the uh, kind of the raw material for some of this work. And then the book that you've just seen outlined. So behind that, there is a massive amount of work. I don't know how many thousands of man and woman hours have gone into this without payment and to try and make things better. So then we look at the next stage. The next stage has got a few elements to it. The first is that going back before we started or before we progressed this particular uh, comparative project, um, we got the five countries that were involved back at the, the first stage to do a much more in-depth um, report card on implementation in their countries. That report card or those report cards exist in draft. The drafts have gone back to the various countries concerned, the teams concerned, and we are now working out exactly how we are going to bring that work together. As at this moment, I've got clear indications of support from a number of the IUCN bodies uh, that you know, we will come together in some way. We will we'll finish this, this multi-country report and then we will launch it and then out of that there will come various things. Um, as well, in each of our, three, of, our, of our three universities, we are progressing this work. So, I'll just outline what we're doing from the University of New England. 
So obviously still driving the, this multi-country approach to an empirically sound evaluation of implementation. In addition, the issue of funding is one that we have taken really seriously. Um, one of the criticisms of environmental law in many countries, including in Australia, is that it, it, it punishes many people who maybe shouldn't be punished. So we end up with a situation where we, are, we have a, a very inefficient regulatory system and governments use regulation when they can't do much else. So because they can't fund what needs to be done, they often resort to inefficient regulation. So we have taken on the project of trying to develop in partnership with a number of organisations, a better investment model for rural biodiversity protection for Australia. And we think if we can get a better debate about the practicalities of protecting the environment in Australia, then we can get better policy and that will lead to not only better protection, but also a, 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 an approach that is not based on blaming farmers who are often in a situation where you know, their, their incomes are volatile, their incomes are fluctuating, and they can't do the sustained investment that is needed to protect the environment. So we're working on that. And we also have another project in, uh, that's being led out of Queensland University of Technology and uh, along with U University of Tasmania and uh, Melbourne University and us, we're, we're looking for a project on restoration and the law and policy and institutional arrangements to improve restoration. As well, of course, we have PhD students and master students doing other things. So from our point of view, that's where we're going to from here. And now I would like to hand over to to Solange first and uh, uh, to, to say what she wishes to say. Uh, I'll make sure that she's, you need to unmute yourself Solange. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, uh, are you hearing me? Uh, it's okay? Is it okay? All good. Okay. okay. All good. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you Paul. Uh, thank you Paul and Miriam that support us doing this a big uh, job. Uh, this book was an effort of uh, a lot of people and uh, I would like also to thank you, Marcia, Gabriel, and all the teams involved in, in UN, in Mackenzie, and also in UNICEUB. And, uh, and I would like to point uh, uh, two things. First of all, I think that we tried to uh, make uh, an evaluation or uh, based all our approach in evidence. And so this is very innovative as a methodological approach. And so uh, this book or this, this work was the, uh, the result of all this effort that we make together. And in this sense, I think also that uh, the book talk a lot about governance, democracy, and information as the basis of uh, accountability and transparency. And so if we need to make proposals for a more effective implementation, we need to know things. And uh, there is something that we know today, and it's very important to highlight, is that uh, our government in this moment and the environmental ministry uh, is trying to pass uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to make a deregulation of all the elements that we have in place in our environmental uh, law. Uh, I mean, uh, he said, uh, um, clearly that uh, uh, we will take advantage of the pandemic of COVID uh, to make environmental legislation more flexible and stretch standards. And so this brings us to the last point or to the second point that I would like to highlight. If uh, we will think about an agenda for our research, uh, thinking about effectiveness, evaluation, and innovation in, in our methodological work, uh, first of all, 
we need to have, it's not only like a flag, it's not only like a pillar, but it's like the foundation and the basis. Democracy still in danger. And so we will need to, um, to bring this, uh, uh, this, this basis of democracy to our, into our research and think about how can we develop this agenda possible thinking about biodiversity, climate change, and all the issues uh, that we are thinking about in the last 10, uh, 15 years, and so on. And uh, um, I'm very happy that this result, uh, this, it, it's, it's interesting because it's a result that came uh, in, in this moment that we cannot be together, but at the same time, I think that we are more together than, uh, than even and thinking about humankind and uh, present and future generations. I think that uh, we need to bring these evaluations and the accountability and the transparency, thinking about environmental democracy and uh, all the things that we are discussing in this uh, latest years. And so thanks a lot, Paul, Miriam. Thank you, Marcia, Gabriel, and I will not say the name of everyone, but thank you for all the team. And uh, uh, sometimes um, we make an effort and we say, oh, but I'm very tired and I'm tired of being uh, just like uh, uh, in a battle and I'm so little, but no, I, I don't think that we are little. We are, we are very strong together and uh, we can bring uh, our little piece in this movement of environmental democracy, thinking about new methodologies and how the academy can contribute to another way or to another strategies to protect, to conserve and to make the restoration of uh, our environment and of biodiversity. Thanks a lot. Thanks, so Marcia, over to you. Okay, so good evening for all my Brazilian friends and good morning for my Australian friends. Uh, what I'd like to say is that this book is an outcome of the collaboration between UNE, UNICEUB, that's the University Center of Brasilia, where I teach, and Mackenzie University where Solange teach. But it began many years ago, I think it was a decade ago, when Professor Paul Martin came uh, to Brazil to teach a course that Professor Solange had organized. And it was a, a, a course for masters and PhD students from UNICEUB and from Mackenzie. In this, uh, uh, in this event, in this course, I met Professor Paul, and it was very funny because we all became very good friends, and from then on, we had many, many, many work together. Um, we organized many events. Paul, Solange, and I, we have organized events in Brazil, congress, workshops, seminars, and in Australia, the, the, the photo shows the last uh, uh, workshop that we had in Australia. Many of my students and Solange students went there. It was a fantastic uh, 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 workshop. And in this book, some of my research groups and Solange's research group members have written chapters yeah, with Australian authors. From my team, I can mention Larissa, Davi, Romana, Lorene, Paulo, and Gabriel. And from Solange's research group, there are Natalia, Carolina, and Mauricio. And we also have invited two experts, Leticia Silva and Massa Pajado, to collaborate in two different chapters. Uh, and Australian authors have been invited by Paul. So with Australian and Brazilian researchers, 
working together, we could analyze and compare different themes related to biodiversity protection in those two countries, Brazil and Australia. And among those issues, I would like to mention mining, protected areas, either marine and terrestrial, indigenous peoples inside protected areas, co-management, uh, uh, the co-management co challenge, new technologies that are being used for biodiversity survey or protection such as satellites and drones and partner governments. And all those things have been objects of research and comparisons. And I can say that I'm very, very happy with the results that were obtained by each team. I think everybody worked really, really hard. And I'm sure that we have achieved a very important and absolutely unprecedented analysis that will be very useful for further studies in those fields. I'm sure that nothing like that has ever been even tried before, and we really, really got a fantastic results. And with the results obtained by each chapter in this book, we have demonstrated that various instruments and strategies that have been used in both countries are inadequate or insufficient to prevent the tremendous loss of species and ecosystems happening in Australia and in Brazil. But creating new ones probably is not the solution. We have to make those we already have effective, and that is the challenge. And we'll certainly have to continue our work because I think that the world is changing very fast and now with the COVID outbreak it will even change faster and I'm pretty sure that we'll face many challenges from now on. Especially in Brazil, as Solange has mentioned, what our uh, Minister from Environment has said, a bomb exploded here in Brazil today. Um, so we got aware of many movements from the government, especially in the environmental field, and they are not very nice. So we are all <clears throat> in shock here. But anyway, uh, I would like really, really to thank Paul and Miriam for the hard work, the fantastic work they have done. We all worked a lot, but uh, Paul and Miriam, they, uh, uh, you know, they did really a great, a hard, a fantastic work. And without them, not, you know, nothing uh, uh, like what we had would be possible. So, Paul, please receive my special thank, not only from, from me, but from my group, you know, from all the members from my research group and also from Solange and the members of her research group. And I hope to continue working together. I think we have many projects and from now on we can do many other great research and have many other great results. So thank you very much, Paul. Okay, so that finishes the launch. You'll see there's a list here of people we need to thank and there's a photo of Lorraine, which I think is the most um, emblematic of this whole thing, the, the, the joy and the fun as well as the hard work. So um, I certainly thank everyone who's been part of this. And now it's open for questions and conversation. I'm trying to work out if I can unmute everyone, but what I'll do for the moment, ah, I can, I think, just, just, just give me one sec. I'm, you see, I'm, I'm like everybody else, I'm learning. Okay, no. So if any of you wish to say something, can you please just indicate on the chat and then I'll unmute and I'll see, I think I can, I think I can do that for everyone. But if you just let me know if you have something you'd like to say, please note that on the chat and then I'll open up that for the people to talk. Nope. Okay. I All right. I shall find 
and again, I'm so sorry that I'm a bit slow on trying to find, ah, here we are, here we are. Oh, I can see a hand wave. There you go. All right. Okay, hopefully this worked. So please talk. Is it Braulio? Yes. Yes, this is Braulio Diaz speaking from Brasilia. Thank you very much for the invitation to uh, participate, to listen to these presentations. Thank you, uh, Paul, uh, and uh, <clears throat> to Marcia and uh, Solange. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it's wonderful to see this work uh, being done. Um, of course, I, I would need to read <laughs> in detail the the findings uh, uh, to be able to grasp uh, better uh, the progress made. Uh, what I can tell you, uh, I just want to make some initial comments. Uh, first of all, uh, at the CBD level, at the global level, and especially when I was the executive secretary for five years, uh, I, I saw it's a common problem uh, for all countries, developed and developing countries. Uh, most countries uh, uh, found it very difficult to comply with the reporting requirements to assess the effective, effectiveness of biodiversity policies in their countries. And uh, most countries didn't, didn't reply at all and just ask for the CBD Secretariat for guidance and methods, etc. So it's good to see this work and certainly I think you need to disseminate uh, more the experience and hopefully expand to include other countries uh, in this process. Uh, the, uh, the CBD uh, uh, faces a, a common problem uh, with other major initiatives such as the SDGs because mo almost all countries uh, uh, are uh, operate through uh, sectors. So we have sectoral laws, sectoral agencies, sectoral policies for agriculture, for environment, for mining, air, energy, and so on. And uh, there's very little uh, uh, dialogue among the sectors in most countries, very little at regional and uh, uh, global level. And um, beyond dialogue, there's very little uh, coordination among the sectors. So that's one of the, the major problems that I see uh, as we, we look forward uh, towards improving our governance. Uh, the CBD has some mechanism to assess uh, uh, effectiveness, uh, but uh, we, we do need to improve them. For example, if you look at the mandate that Substa uh, has, the science uh, uh, subsidiary body, one of their mandates, mandates it has always been since the beginning to assess the effectiveness of the kinds of measures taken by parties. Substa never did that. It, in my time there, uh, during the five years, I tried to insist on that, but I, I confess I failed. Uh, there are some other weak uh, mechanisms for review and assessments. I, uh, the strongest uh, uh, that we have is the national reporting and the updating of uh, NBSAPs. But clearly uh, we need uh, 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 to, to enhance our work. Um, one example from Brazil and from Latin America has been the initiative of the national auditing agencies. So the Brazilian National Auditing Agency has led a continental uh, effort in the whole of Latin America since 2015 to uh, assess the effectiveness of protected areas. Uh, uh, initially working with some 12 countries, now I think they're going to reach out to uh, uh, I think more than 18 countries. Uh, this is quite interesting because uh, auditing agencies can issue uh, reports and uh, make recommendations that are uh, almost mandatory for governments to comply with. 
So it has more teeth uh, uh, to it. So that's quite interesting. Another uh, 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 quite different comment. You didn't mention much about uh, land tenure in the two countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a, a, a key issue uh, uh, that affects everything in terms of governance for biodiversity conservation. Uh, 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 Brazil, half of the country is public land almost all of it in the Amazon. The rest of the country is almost fully private land. And so um, the establishment of public protected areas outside of the Amazon is very difficult and very costly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, an interesting issue also uh, that I didn't hear from you is how the two countries recognize uh, 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 land property rights. So in Brazil, the Brazilian constitution since the 1930s, and this was uh, highlighted in the, our current constitution in 88, uh, private property is only recognized to the extent that they also fulfill uh, 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 collective uh, 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 objectives. So uh, the uh, private prop property in Brazil uh, is only recognized to the extent that uh, landowners uh, uh, protect the environment, landowners exploit natural resources in, in a rational way. In those days, they didn't use the word sustainable, and to the extent they protect their employees. So based on that, since the 1930s, since 1934, in Brazil, there are specific requirements for ecosystem conservation in Brazil uh, in place. Of course, the uh, uh, enforcement of this has always been uh, not uh, that good, but uh, uh, for you to have an idea, just in the areas of savannas of central Brazil where I work, which we call the Cerrados, that's about a quarter of the country, so it's a big area. Uh, uh, public protected areas uh, uh, only represent about 3%, of this biome. Uh, indigenous land only represent about 5%. So if you put the two together and the land of the indigenous lands is public land, it's 88%. But the uh, conservation requirements of the forest code in Brazil uh, uh, requires that landowners protect and maintain and restore significant amount of, of uh, ecosystems. So the la latest estimate for the Cerrado biome in Brazil is, uh, uh, if you sum up all the private land in the Cerrado biome, it's uh, uh, more than 55 million hectares. So it's uh, uh, about the size of continental France. So it's a huge area, and that's an area we need to pay more attention. So, okay, so uh, perhaps we, we emphasize too much public, pro uh, public protected areas. And so, I think for the future, Brian, we need more private protected area. Yes, Paul, I, I think what, what you've just raised, a number of those issues we've certainly considered, and I really do appreciate, and for obviously the great depth of knowledge that you've got, so we do need to talk more going forward. Um, I will say that what you've, the issues you've raised, they could justify a couple of hours seminar, each of them themselves. And so I do hope that we get the chance to, um, to engage more and see where we take this to. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's pretty significant. The issue of land, land tenure, land rights, we did in our research, we looked at that quite a lot, but we certainly didn't write a chapter specifically on that. Um, I'd like to open up for two other people who've indicated they might want to say something. Uh, Charles, who I'll ask next, and then George, he didn't ask to speak, but he sent me a note and um, I wasn't able to reply on the machine to him. And George has been fantastic in terms of the, the work we've been doing. So I first get Charles and then George to make any comments or raise questions or issues. Hi, can you all hear me? Yep. Good. Hi to everyone from Brazil and Australia. I just want to say a few words. First, congratulations to everyone on the success of this book. It's hard work and we have achieved a great results. 
and hopefully we will make a real difference. Um, a very, very, very special thanks to Paul. Um, I know how hard it, it was, Paul, last year when we were in Malaysia hmm. at the conference. And um, yeah, I know how hard it was at that time, we're trying to write the chapters and finish our chapters. So yes, very, very special thanks to Paul. And of course, we should not forget Miriam, Miriam for her endless, endless and tireless work in producing the book in the end. Um, there's a lot of editing work Miriam did. So a very, very special thanks to Miriam as well. Marcia, Solange, Gabriel, also, and also to all authors. I know how hard it was for every one of us to fit in our family and work and teaching and research and all of that. And then trying to get this book out. So yes, I think we must acknowledge our effort our effort that we put in for to produce this book. So yes, um, really, really good work. So yes, congratulations to everyone. And that's all I wanted to say. Paul? Great. I've got too many things that I have to try and control. Um, so George, would you like to say something at this point? Yes, sir. good evening, good morning. Uh, congratulations to everybody. It has been a pleasure. I have learned a lot among lawyers uh, and I am a blood economist. And <laughs> I have a question to provoke on the future steps. Um, my question is, and Romana uh, is beside me also uh, asking the same question. Have we uh, been effective in showing what are the social gains, the social benefits of diverse conservation to those that are not, or those who do not have a conservationist ideology? If the answer is yes, how to keep this in the future? If the answer is no, how to start uh, making this? Govern does not exist in abstract. It is a reflection of our society. And if you don't have this society with us in terms of conservation, the biodiverse, we, are, uh, we have a problem. Thank you very much for your time. Very well done. I hope I can see you personally uh, in the near future. I have been at home for seven, five days, and I'm a little bit mad uh, to try to get out of here. Uh, thank you. Uh, all the best for all of you. Thanks, George. Uh, I'll, I'll invite Solange or Marcia if they wish to comment in reply. I mean, obviously, we very much are on the same page, but I'll, would you, either of you wish to make any comment in relation to George's comment? No, sounds like they've been stunned. Stunned by the wisdom of an economist. Now that's scary. <laughs> now we have a question about um, uh, replicating this work in other parts and it references particularly Africa. So when the next and the final document out of this work we started years ago comes out, uh, the final report, the aim is to have demonstrated the method and to have demonstrated that the method can work and that it's a method that can be used by lawyers. Um, I make that point particularly because there are plenty of evaluation methods that exist, but the culture of lawyers and our skills, um, and particularly our training, don't suit many of them for the way that we work. And they don't necessarily even suit the nature of law where facts, which of course the base of science are interwoven with non facts, with values, beliefs, you know, the whole concept of justice. How do you empirically play with that in the scientific method? So the method is um, now being shared. The final report will share it 
further. And then I'm hoping that with our collaboration with the other um, legal parts of the IUCN and other parts, the social and, and other groups within the other commissions within the IUCN, that we will begin to see this kind of quite careful analysis occur in other countries and definitely in Africa, um, just about everywhere. I can't think of a place where, where it's not needed. Um, though I do note that the quality of implementation, uh, some countries do implementation quite well, um, many countries don't. So uh, I think that the goal is to start seeing a more, more empirically sound but law compatible approach to looking at implementation around the world. I will make one final point about that. One of the things that, because I've been reading all sorts of countries, fifth reports and sixth reports, those that are putting in their reports. And one thing that I have noticed is that um, accountability is actually getting weaker in many ways because countries are now choosing what they report against. So some are selecting amongst the uh, various scorecards, the SDGs would be an example, and reporting against that. And that's really quite dangerous because the, if you look at, for example, the SDGs, it allows people to mix up uh, economic development and environment protection and social justice. And so we're getting to the point where we are measuring so many things that it's almost made accountability negligible. Uh, which is a very perverse outcome from everybody who's trying to make accountability stronger. Anyway, so I think that I, I will close the meeting off and thank everybody. Um, sorry we can't share a glass, but we'll do that next time we get together. And uh, look, I, I thank everybody and I will, I will now um, uh, close off the close off the, um, the, the, the webinar. So thank you, everybody. Stay safe, stay sane, and we will, um, we will see you sometime soon, we all, we hope. So good morning or good evening. Ciao.